Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to thank uh, James Taylor and the Heartland Institute for the uh, invitation. It's a great honor for me to uh, talk about um, some of the history that uh, I was, uh, when I was involved in uh, renewable energy research. And uh, I wanted to tell a little story about that because it all kind of uh, fits in into the policy side. So I know that when I show one equation, I lose half the audience. So I don't show any equations, um, even though my background is physics. So you are at the, at the mostly based policy talk. So I, I try to do my best as a, as a scientist and uh, experimental researcher. So let's see if this works. No. Ah, let's just yeah. Make sure it's yeah. Okay. All right. I figured it out. So <laughs> thank you. Um, just a little background. Um, first of all, Harry Reid. I'm not sure if everybody knows who Harry Reid is. After which that center was named. He was uh, a long-time U.S. senator. He was in the uh, Obama administration, the uh, Senate Majority Leader. And the center was named after him way before I got there in the, I think, early 90s or in, in that range. So, so it, it is usually not done that you name centers after sitting U.S. politicians. But in this case, uh, Nevada granted an exception. So that's where the Harry Reid comes in. So he's, he's actually the, the uh, was the Senate Majority Leader. And UNLV is the local university. Uh, it's the University of Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, that research center uh, was, was founded in 1981, I think at that time it was one of the first centers. It grew considerably over the years. Um, it was 100% research grant funded. Um, maybe there were a couple of percent of state funds in there as well at, from time to time. It actually had uh, facilities, 53,000 square feet, uh, museum, auditorium offices, and so on. We had over 100 plus employees and students. Um, we had our own small in-house data center. Uh, we averaged about $7 million a year in new grant funding. And we had on average about 24 million in open grants during the operations. And uh, in 2013, when the center was shut down, it averaged two and a half times the funding of all other 60 research centers of the campus combined. So that's the history of the center. Here's some pictures from the street and the campus view. Um, so it's a real building. It's still there. So it's a uh, building didn't move. But <laughs> anyway, we had partnerships with uh, universi 21 universities. We were partnered up with 12 national labs, industry partners 11, and grant sponsors were 36. So we actually did work with industry. We had industry projects. We actually worked tech transfer. Everybody, you know, what people complain about that some national labs don't do so good that they work with uh, industry partners, but um, we tried our best, and we had really good partnerships and developed great products and so on. So I don't want to go into all this. But anyway, we also did education at the facility. Um, that is, was, of course, linked to the colleges who are the main educating uh, pieces of the campus, because the uh, Harriet Center itself was not uh, accredited. Uh, educating entity. Nevertheless, the researchers that worked there worked with the colleges on educating the students on various um, programs. And I just, you know, listed the ones that we have. We had over, I don't know, three, four hundred students. It was quite a 
quite an operation by itself, right? So um, the research areas. Now here I have to go a little bit back because there's always a prequel to the whole thing. It's, it's similar like Star Wars. Once you see all the, the Star Wars uh, sequences, then they come up with the prequels, what happened before the whole thing started, right? So there's always a history. So my history was that in 2006, I got involved by another, by another unit that was uh, taken down by the university, the uh, 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 research, the Harriet Research uh, uh, facility that was uh, linked to the research park. Um, and that had various programs, including renewable energy programs. And uh, I was the one who was, uh, became an administrator, a research administrator, uh, taking over the, the yellow highlighted areas in solar biofuels and hydrogen research that um, that facility or that entity had on hand. Somebody needed to manage those faculty, staff, and students and to build the connection with the, mostly the Department of Energy to uh, manage those programs. Then in, when I became the executive director of the Harry Reid Center, we moved those programs into the Harry Reid Center and continued uh, the research on, on those uh, programs. I also started what's called the Clean Energy Symposium in 2007. That was the first of its kind and I invited researchers from uh, all over the country to come and speak about their clean energy projects, uh, green energy projects from solar, wind, biofuels, and we had algae research done, and I mean, that was a, was a very uh, a colorful mix of uh, research, and you, can you could tell there was a lot of research, right? It was not, the commercial aspect was really minimal. Um, because every, everybody admitted it's very expensive, expensive to commercialize it, to replace the biofuels, uh, the fuels with biofuels. Um, and on a large scale, it's expensive. Solar energy is expensive, wind en energy is expensive. So we kind of uh, had a lot of insight in, in, in those uh, uh, research backgrounds. Um, from the, the folks that actually worked in those areas, right? Now, we had, uh, I think it was around 2009, uh, Harry Reid put on the first Clean Energy Summit here in Las Vegas. And I remember very well, they kind of called me up if I would be happy to help them. And I thought, sure, you know, let's talk about your summit. And the next day, I had like 20 staff us in my office to, uh, to get this uh, program going, which I thought at the time was a, was a great idea to promote clean energy research and uh, a development of clean energy systems. And uh, so that's kind of where the, uh, uh, um, the interest was growing. You know, we had a lot of uh, interest here from, from, from media and everywhere from about these uh, um, clean energy projects. The other areas that are listed are also areas that either I was involved with, uh, in and establishing. The, the ones that are listed in red is kind of that I was involved in, in, in starting up at the Harry Reid Center. The others were uh, already predating me. But you see, we had a lot of different research areas. So seven million a year to go somewhere, right? So there was a lot of, lot of people working on different aspects. Now, the solar in particular, the solar research that we did was uh, mainly focused on um, new solar cell materials um, solar thermal uh, hydrogen production and hydrogen storage. These were kind of the links. Um, and, and so 
there was, these were massive programs, and there was, uh, you know, universities and national labs involved, and we had uh, 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 millions of dollars go into this research. The uh, interesting thing was that it always was too expensive. Solar fuel was, uh, for hydrogen was estimated at its best at about $4 a liter or kilogram. So it's, it, it would have been, as, as, uh, as we were told here by Wolfgang, it would have been $16 a gallon, right? So to kind of replace a fuel. So it was a very expensive uh, um, uh, uh, fuel idea, let's put it this way. It's not that it's impossible, but it's just not economically feasible. And that's really what came out of a lot of this research that we've done there. Um, nobody else had those numbers until they finally got determined. Now, what you do with those numbers is a different question. I found it interesting that after it became clear that the numbers are too high to be economical, that suddenly the message changed from the uh, clean energy meetings. It shifted to climate change. Suddenly, we had to do it because the climate is changing. And I said, wait a minute, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's too expensive. We have to find cheaper ways to not kind of force something down people's throat. Now, my opinion on climate change at the time, it was about 12 years ago, 10 years ago, was not very popular, and as, as I said, they shut down the facility, the Harry Center, in 2013. So now you can draw your own conclusions um, why that happened. But effectively, um, at the time, I was not really supporting the idea of finding an expensive technology to, uh, to, and then justify it with climate change. So the, uh, um, the, the main ideas, and I was kind of asked to talk more about solar. We, we know there's three types of energy systems that are mainly in the solar range. It's a photovoltaic, there's a solar thermal power production, and then the rooftop as a, as a kind of a niche for some homeowners. And um, the solar thermal power production here in Las Vegas, or near Las Vegas, in the El Dorado Valley, is Solar One that was already established almost 20 years ago. And uh, it even produces power in January. So uh, the, the sun is, is very powerful. Now, as I was there in January, it produced two megawatts. It was not really impressive, right, for a facility of that size, but it, it does produce some power. So it's, it's one of the areas where you can actually use solar thermal. Now, not that it's the price of the facility was, you know, grant the output, but it, it does work. So solar, uh, the challenges to solar power is, as we, kind of, as we know, there's a it's a low energy density, it's unreliable, depends on sunshine. Now here we have luckily a lot, but in other areas, not as many, much sunshine. Um, there's no low cost energy storage. Grid integration is volatile, difficult. Um, no energy generation at night, and it eventually leads to this famous duck curve. And um, other challenges include toxic materials, um, there just in 2016, there was 250,000 tons of toxic waste generated from solar facilities that were decommissioned. This is from Schellenberger, 2018, and Forbes. Um, large areas are needed. Tamil Nadu in, in India covers 10 square kilometers for 600 megawatts. It's inefficient. You are weather dependent. Once the temperature hits 87 Fahrenheit, the efficiency goes down by 1% per degree up. Uh, it need, needs a lot of water, thousands of gallons per megawatt for the weekly cleaning. 
and it needs about 15 times more materials than nuclear power plants to build, and that's a low estimate. Now, since we already talked about nuclear, <laughs> it's a segue. We had a great presentation the other day. Uh, uh, Bob, who is here, Bob Bauman, talked about nuclear energy production. So I don't go too much into the details um, because he covered a lot of it. But the, the one aspect I want to uh, bring up is the spent nuclear fuel from the uh, light water reactors. This is kind of considered a problem. Nevada has been struggling with Yucca Mountains for decades, and I don't think it's a great idea to just dig a hole and put the stuff in. It's better to reuse it with the so-called fast reactors that could be built as small modular reactors at the reactor sites and burn up the fuel and effectively get rid of the uh, transuranics that cause the uh, long-lasting uh, radioactivity in the waste and effectively make it much more manageable. And uh, on my last slide, if you want to learn about fast reactors, there's a YouTube link that you can watch. I don't want to go into all the technology of that, but it is a viable technology and it's a good base to build on. And there's about $45 billion sitting on the federal government to address the waste issue. So it's not something that, is not, that there's no money. So thank you for your attention and for coming, and great to be here.